All right, I'm out here at Bodega Bay and I'm super excited to share some nature journaling adventures with you today. I am super happy, really glad to be out here testing out some new gear. As you probably know, I'm getting ready to go to the Grand Canyon. I'm gonna be nature journaling there. And I'm testing out some waterproof gear today. So I'm gonna talk about some of the gear and I'm gonna do some nature journaling in this tidal marsh here. And you get to come along with me and check it out. So really looking forward to that. And um, I'll be telling you more about this gear in a minute. But first I'm gonna open up a can of mate just in case I'm not excited enough already. Just being here, nature journaling with all of you. A little bit of caffeine is gonna make me even more excited. So as you probably can guess, I'm probably gonna start with the landscape Ito because look at where I am. It's beautiful out here and getting a little bit of the context, the perspective before I start getting in real close and like geeking out on the little stuff that's going on out here, getting in the perspective is gonna be really important. So let's do a watercolor landscape right now. This is this new waterproof bag that I'm testing out. I'm gonna be taking on my trip, but I wanna test out a little bit right now. So this is a totally dry, dry bag. It's from, the company is called Watershed. And I thought this was the closest thing to my current nature journaling bag, been a dry proof version. So far, it's not anywhere near as convenient, that's for sure. Um, this is the special closure that it has to um, be completely submersible. And so far, it has no internal organization. So I just threw all my nature journaling stuff in there. Of course, I got my frame, super important. Got my clips, these are for holding the pages open. And I'm gonna use a pencil for the frame and this gray marker for the drawing and then I'll go to the watercolor. Ooh, check out the pelicans. I just saw a ton of pelicans diving on a bait ball of fish pelicans and other birds. This is a really, really cool spot for birding, lots of shore birds. So on a day like today, it's really easy to paint the water and the sky blue, but they're not blue. Look at the sky and the water. Do those look blue to you? They're not blue over there. They're not blue in front of me. They're not blue behind me. If they're not blue, don't paint them blue. So blue is one of the most dangerous colors, especially when you're first learning about color. It's so bright, you think you understand it, but you really don't. And it's also really dark. So it's hard to get uh, a blue that is not also very dark. And so uh, when it comes to dark and light, that's actually more important than color tone i mean value is more important than color so noticing how much darker the bits of land are than the sky and the water that's the most important thing even if you get the sky and the water blue but they're darker than the land that's that's worse so they're actually a very gray color today gray is also challenging to mix a gray that's not too dark so I'm gonna be really careful and I'm gonna put a ton of water into my gray here. I might put a teeny, teeny bit of blue, but I want it to be really um, toned down. So these might be cool grays behind me. So the blue can help you get that cool gray, but you don't wanna make sky or ocean blue if they really aren't. Um, so now I'm gonna paint in that color and try to keep it really, really light value to reflect the reality. A lot of times you'll, it, it's a good trick when you're painting to use the same mixture for the, the sky and the water because in reality they're often related colors. So a lot of times the water is reflecting the colors in the sky. So when you paint them, while you have that color mixed up, go ahead and put it into the water and the sky. Now I'm gonna wait for that to dry before I start going into my next lightest 
color. And my next lightest color is going to be some of this vegetation. As you can see, there's some really pale dead vegetation. That dead vegetation is a pale color, a, a light value. And in the background, the way in the background, I want all of the background to be a light value, but there's some sand dunes with grass growing on them. And those are a pretty pale value as well. And it looks like there's gonna be, as the tide is going out right now, it looks like there's going to be some pelicans chilling right there in front of me. I can't believe I didn't bring my binoculars. I didn't bring my binoculars today because I was worried about being able to have waterproof stuff with me. But for all the birds here, binoculars or even a scope would be the way to go. And I'm noticing, dang, maybe I should be doing some type of time related change over time type nature journaling because these mud flats behind me are getting more exposed as the water goes out. And there's probably gonna be a lot of really cool stuff changing with time. So that would be a fun thing to try. Oh, I just found a dead crab. Look at this baby crab that I just found. So nature is distracting. This is gonna be super cool thing to nature journal in a second. Maybe I could draw that while my watercolor is drying out here. My landscape beat though is still drying. Draw this crab. The challenges of having a totally open bag with no internal organization is beginning. I, I couldn't find my pen for a second there. Cool, arthropods, oh yeah, arthropods are always so fun to draw. So the arthropods include all these critters with exoskeletons. Um, arthropod is a great taxon to be aware of because if you're talking about uh, bugs or crabs or insects or tarantulas, spiders, ticks, um, things like that, if you're not totally sure, um, which of those subcategories, smaller categories, smaller taxon, taxa it falls into, then you can just call it an arthropod. So arthropods are really fun to draw. Landscape Ito is ready for the next round. Thank you, crab. That was really fun. I'll come back to you in a second. Hopefully I won't accidentally step on it. Okay, now I'm gonna go in and do my next color. Um, and I think I'm gonna use this buff titanium, which is a really cool color. It's very opaque, um, but it's it's the closest approximation to this this dead vegetation that I'm seeing kind of mix in. I think it's dead eelgrass um, on top of bits of the pickleweed. And I might even use the same um, to have continuity and also because it looks pretty similar. I'm going to use this in the background. I think those are some sand dunes over there. That's the protected part of Bodega Head. Um, and there's grass growing on them, but I'm gonna start with this base of buff titanium. One thing you can do at this stage of a watercolor painting, and this is a really good technique, and sometimes just sticking to one simple technique and keeping it that way is really powerful, but one technique is to um, just start with a base color and put it underneath everything on your first wash, and then start with that base color being your most light value, your palest color, and then going from there. And that way you have that base color is actually underlying everything else. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and do that with this buff titanium. I'm just gonna put it everywhere here, keep things simple. Buff titanium under all of that. And I'm gonna make a little bit already, a little bit stronger in the front to bring that front area. You always want the front to have more saturation, more darkness, more contrast, more warmth, and more saturation and more details. That's called atmospheric perspective. All right, you can see what I'm going for there. Still pretty pale. And I'm gonna build up on top of that, but I'm gonna let that cool off. I mean, dry out. Maybe you already knew this, but crab claws have one stationary bit and one bit that moves up and down and 
it seems like it's always the top bit that is the moving one and the bottom one is stationary and is just part of that um the rest of the the claw where the muscle is all right so i'm building out that a little bit on the side next to my landscape this would be a good place to put some text i'm gonna use my tombow pin just to sketch in some of my my usage of space here which i haven't I've just been kind of free flowing with it so far. <clears throat> Excuse me, Marley, how rude. Got some burps from that mate. Okay, so now let's see here. I'm gonna put up I'm gonna put this box here for a design element here. Probably will be some text. Maybe I'll just stop talking for a little bit and write. Write some of my observations. You know, people say a picture is worth a thousand words, but sometimes a word or a phrase is worth a thousand pictures when you have to draw the pictures yourself. It's different when you get to take a photo, then it's really easy to say that a picture is worth a thousand words. But if you have to draw that picture, okay, it's a whole nother story because with our words, we can quickly write something down that might take a long time to draw and that drawing might be open to interpretation. Like, is that really a duck? But with words, boom, you can do it. Even if you don't have color, you can write color down. Describe color, describe numbers, all kinds of things. So let's see, I'll have that design element there. Then maybe this will just be free floating, free floating stuff down here, but just chunk that in. And you can see that's going basically in the rule of thirds. So that ought to work. And then maybe while I have the Tombow pin out, I'll think about how I'm gonna do my other side maybe make it a reflection. So one downside of doing this is that you could easily, um, you know, like later when I'm out there and, and I find something really cool, it might not fit into this layout that I started to create for myself. And then I might get precious and be like, oh, I'm not gonna include that because I want it to look good. I want it to match the layout. That would be a mistake. Do not do that but sometimes it happens, so just, just practice self-awareness around it, but just realize that if you start laying out your pages before you're actually nature journaling, that can be a, a problem that will come up. Dang, my feet are starting to sweat in these booties. I probably shouldn't have put them on, but I was thinking that I was gonna be walking around out there in the marsh where there could be like broken glass or old shipwrecks or stingrays or whatever. Actually, there's no stingrays here. I know of and so I usually go barefoot but in this mud I was planning on wearing these booties just to be on the safe side I don't want any injuries before my Grand Canyon trip but now my feet are all sweating in here Woo. okay now my watercolor is dry enough on my landscape ito so I can keep going with that landscape ito okay so now I'm looking and I think I'm gonna go start adding this green and pink for the pickleweed. There's a lot of pickleweed growing here. Ooh, I just got a lovely aroma of some bay fermentation, putrefication. It's really easy to use oversaturated greens. Um, I'm really grateful that I use this palette that John Muir Laws put together and it has a lot of pre-mixed greens. Not pre-mixed, but you know, it's not just one green that I have to, and green is already a secondary color. Some people don't even have green in their palette if you really wanna be limited, but I'd way rather have some more green options that I can use um, instead of starting with something really saturated and having to tone it down every time. It's definitely good to know how to um, tone down colors and mix colors and mix everything from the primaries but especially out here in the field if I can start with a green that's not super saturated um, I'm gonna be happy oh, here's some interesting bird calls okay now it looks like there's some brown too so I'm gonna whoa I had a little bit too much green still on there but I went straight into I think this is my um, Monte Amiata nat natural sienna Monte Amiana Natural Siena. It's a mountain in um, 
Italy, but it's a really great brown. It's, it's sort of like a golden brown. Um, I went straight into there while I still had some chromium oxide on my brush, but now I'm gonna come in, come in here. Now I have to remember that these, these, this, this pale um, buff titanium I put in there, I, I wanna leave that. So it'd be really easy right now to not be thinking about that negative space, but I need to keep looking at my subject and remembering, okay, where is that buff titanium color where the, the dry eelgrass is and make sure that that looks like a shape that makes sense instead of just sort of like a byproduct of, um, and that's the weird thing about reserving colors in watercolor. It's not what, not people are used to thinking of drawing as additive, but um, you have to be thinking about it from a, sort of subtractive point of view too is like what is the shape that is being left by your paint your your brush strokes like what is the shape that is being left over after you fill in a sh another shape with your brush stroke um, and if you can start controlling those shapes the negative ones then you end up um, having much better luck and I, and I think that's one of the things that is um, when people say oh watercolor is hard that's what they mean a lot of times is that um, they're not able to get those negative shapes or reserved whites to work for them. And they wanna be able to come back in um, with a lighter value and draw the lighter value instead of working it um, negatively. All right, so I'm, I'm trying to build this up a little bit here. I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit of a glare. Uh, I'm trying to build this up the color there on this vegetation. Now I've got that. There's gonna be a little bit of dark mud there in between that vegetation and the the puddle of water in the middle. But I'm gonna go into the background first. And the background you gotta be careful with. So if you look out across this bay that's getting shallower and shallower as the tide goes out, you can see that across the bay there's um, some dark trees. And it would be really easy. Those are probably the darkest thing in my whole landscape but if I make them that dark it might bring them up into the foreground too much and if, if you use your imagination a little bit you can see there's a little bit of a haze in between us and those trees and then definitely on those sand dunes those vegetated sand dunes back there I want to be careful um, I know there's some warm colors back there but I definitely definitely don't want to show too much warmth back there because you know what I might do and this would be sort of creative license but what I might do is just invent a cool color for back there and what I could do is like put a little bit of purple or a little bit of blue over that um, or a bluish green something like that and that makes it seem like it's far away and so that a lot of times that illusion of depth is even more important than being true to the color um, because you're being true to the distance, the sense of distance and depth, which is really important to the human mind when looking at a landscape. All right, so let's, let's get that background a little bit. Make sure I'm using less color back there. I'm gonna start with the, um, the sand dunes and I kind of have mixed feelings of, of whether I should just paint it purple back there. I did that on, on a painting not that long ago. Um, and I painted the background mountain purple, uh, even though it wasn't really purple. And it looked great. I was not, I had no regrets about it because it made it recede into the distance so well. So let's see if I can come up with like a gray color, um, some type of cool gray color that would work here for that. And maybe even a little bit of that like chromium oxide or something. Would chromium oxide work? Um, Cause the chromium oxide looks similar to the color of the dune grass. Uh, and it's kind of a cool, there's not very much yellow. I mean, is there yellow? I don't know. It's, it's, it's sort of a cooler, cooler pale green. Uh, it's not very saturated, but I'm mixing it here with Mixing it in here with some gray and a little bit of blue even. I kind of like the way that's looking. It's a little bit dark, but let's see if I can make it lighter by adding water. 
Let's see if I can put some of that into the background, see if that does anything. I also don't want to add too much detail or contrast back there. If there were really strong contrast or detail, it would bring that element into the foreground. So I kind of just went over the whole thing with this wash of that mix that I made. It cooled it down a little bit, added a little bit more color to it. Also the value, see, this is where I'm gonna get messed up right now, is look at the value of those sand dune hills. They're like half a degree different from the value of the sky and the water. But I actually, in real life, if you look at them, they're probably twice as dark, three times as dark, maybe more. And so this is where this happens to me, and this is something I'm trying to get better at, is it's hard for me to get the values correctly because I end up just getting my background shapes too close in value to my sky or my water. Shoot. Um, I, th I think I'm, I've probably done like three washes there. I'm not gonna do any more because it's gonna start messing up the paper. Now I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna do this mud. I'm not gonna get too, I can't get too precious with this landscape beat though because this is just the start for, for my session. So the start of your session and your first drawing, whether it's a landscape beat or whatever it is, has an impact on the rest of your session. So don't get too precious at the beginning too busy even though it, it if you look at it with the, the pickle weed and everything it is kind of busy um, and kind of weird hard to draw there's some grass mixed in I, can't, I think that's the salt grass it looks like um it looks like Bermuda grass but it's a California native I mean even look at this behind me how busy it is and all that dead um, eel grass I think that washes up during like big storms it must play an important role um, in the nutrient cycling here. I'll have to write down some questions about that. But um, in my painting, it looks kind of weird, I think, uh, the busyness, but whatever, okay. Uh, now I'm gonna come into the background here and paint those dark trees. So one of the things that I like about John Muir Law's palette is it's got these, it, in each sector, um, it has really dark dark so for example in the greens there's this perylene green right here and if you instantly instantly need to get a dark dark green whoa just got paint on my shirt if you instantly need a dark dark green you just go straight into that perylene right there um, if you're in the blue the endanthron blue is great uh, down here the the bloodstone genuine is really dark for the browns um, for the, the warm colors, the yellows and the reds and the oranges, a little bit harder, but like the naphthamide maroon is pretty, pretty good and pretty cool. Um, and then the, the quinacridone, what is that? Quinacridone red or something? Quinacridone sienna. That's a really cool toned and pretty dark uh, warm color. All right, so let's see, where was I? Yeah, yeah I got this dark perylene green and I think I'm gonna add they're almost black from this distance. Ooh, but remember, they're, I don't wanna make them too dark because they're in the background, and I definitely don't wanna make them too green. Um, so I'm gonna tone this down with like, I'm gonna get crazy. I'm gonna use shadow violet to tone it down. Do, do, do. Oh yeah, that's kinda makes it a little bit brown. And let's see, let's see how this works back here. Ah, something's biting me on the leg. The new look, I'm gonna start a trend, I think wearing a rain jacket with short shorts and um, booties, neoprene booties. Good for the for formal, formal wear or uh, social events during quarantine, especially popular. Um, the neoprene booties don't breathe very well, so your feet develop a a nice odor that keeps people at a safe six feet away during quarantine. Whoa, I'm coming down into the water. It's it's not like it's not not looking good. That's getting too crazy over there. You can see that definitely is way darker than anything in my foreground. So I'm gonna come back to my foreground here 
Maybe I'll add a little bit of texture or like a reflection with the water, try to get fancy with the water because I do have some water here in my foreground. You see that puddle right there? I got that. And see those, you can see those trees back there. They're not that green. So that is the other problem color, okay? I said blue, blue skies is a problem. Green trees is a problem. As soon as someone sees a tree, they, they, they get out the, the green crayon or the green whatever, and they just, they go crazy with it before they actually pay attention to like, what color is that tree actually? A lot of times they're not really green, you know? Um, so be careful about that. So now I'm gonna come back to my foreground. I'm gonna see if I can get the color of this pickleweed situation a little bit. Ooh, the bird, bird patterns are changing. Look at this channel has formed here. Almost getting completely dried up over there. Do you think I should try, do you think I should try walking out across that mud with my nature journaling stuff? I think that's what, uh, what I'm gonna do. Even though sitting here and doing this landscape beat in a nice comfortable chair, drinking my mate, I'm getting kind of lazy, you know? Getting kind of comfortable. All right, let me darken this mud flat here. Get that a little bit darker. A lot of times for a landscape eat though this size, I won't work work it this many times. I just kind of be like boom and done. Um, whether I get it, whether I get the values right the first time or not, I kind of just try to bust it out and, and do really fast. I don't know why, but I'm trying to be a little more precise right now um, and, and get these some of these values more accurately and take my time. For this size of a drawing, sometimes I do one like this as a five minute, but now this is gonna be like a 20 minute. But you can see the values are it's starting to build up the values a little bit more accurately. That's the most important thing. Now let me see if I can get fancy with this water here in the foreground and then I'll call it finished. What do I see in the water over here? What do you see like in this pond in front of me, this puddle? It's not that much going on. Maybe there's some reflections of the pickle weed and not all of that was in my frame. So I have to be careful not to invent stuff that's not in my original frame. And this is something we do all the time. And that's why it's so great to practice with that cropping tool because it tells you what to, what to actually draw and what not to draw. But then once you get to the watercolor phase and you put your cropping tool away, your frame, uh, your viewfinder, it's easy to start adding stuff in, especially when you get that like creative feeling like, ooh, let me just add a little bit of this reflection here and this there, or look at this little texture there. And next thing you know, you're adding stuff that wasn't like even inside of your original frame of reference. So I'm going to try not to do that right now. Sometimes just a suggestion of a reflection is better than trying to make something that actually looks like a mirror. A lot of times that doesn't really work so well. Okay, I am done with this landscapeito. Let's see, all these are relatively dry. Sop that up a little bit, and then I can close this thing and put it in the dry bag. Now would be a good time to have a big rubber band. I thought I had one. Put a big rubber band around that right there. JP told me to get some big rubber bands for my Colorado River trip. Do you use rubber bands? Do you use rubber bands in your art supplies? Let me know in the comments down below. Oh, I'm gonna try something. What if I just put these on there? Whoa! That did not work. It shot the thing out of there. Okay, that's a bad idea. Good thing that didn't fly into the ocean. So it's a little disorganized in my bag. As you can see, no internal pockets or anything for organization. It's getting kind of crazy in there. At first I was like fine with it, but now I'm like, oh, I'm stuck. 
That was so fun painting that landscape, Vito, and I got so into it that I didn't even have time to fit the rest of my amphibious nature journaling into this episode. So stay tuned for a future episode in a couple weeks. I'll be in the Grand Canyon by then, but stay tuned for future episodes where I'm going to go fully amphibious. You can find out if I was able to attract and nature journal live leopard sharks in that channel and other amphibious nature journaling adventures in a future episode. Bye!